Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to Versus Stars Podcast. All my loyal listeners, thank you for your continued support. And remember, click the subscribe button, everybody. It's an amazing episode because Benjamin Morris boards the mothership. He's the writer of August, Purgatory Underground. Come aboard as we go traversing the stars. Hello, Mr. Morris. Thank you so much for coming to Versus Stars Podcast. Thanks for having me. Awesome to be here. Oh, it's totally my pleasure. So I, I always start off with a question of inspiration. So what inspired your love of comics and who are your earliest influences? Uh, earliest influences were probably like everybody my age, you know, Jim Lee, Rob Liefeld, all that stuff. I still think there's a bit of that in my work. I try to keep that in there. Uh, as I got a little older and was more, uh, you know, influenced by other stuff, you know, Steve Rude, Al Williamson became kind of my two favorites that, you know, I was really into them when I was a kid. And you know, as I've gotten older, I've just grown to appreciate, you know, the draftsmanship and all the quality that bring the things uh, even more. When you decide that you're, you're interested in doing comic books yourself? Pretty much always. I, I, as early as I can remember, I would always be excited to see Superman, the movie on ABC. It'd be like the Sunday night movie. And I just was like so excited about that. It was my favorite thing in the world. I get a few comics when I was, you know, before I was like five or so, I can remember having a few issues of Justice League and some Star Wars stuff. And kind of got a little bit out of that until I was 10 and was more into baseball. And once Batman, the movie came out in 89, I was just, it's been comics ever since. I couldn't imagine. I, mean, I, have, a, I have a day job. I do graphic design, animation, and, and video editing stuff. But uh, comics has always been my, my, my passion, I would say. So you're right now the writer of August Purgatory Underground. So what inspired the creation of the series and what intrigued you about the concept? The, it had a really really circuitous sort of route to becoming, you know, a real story. I initially, I was working on a comic for Dynamite, just doing art uh, for Warehouse 13, which I was not ready to do schedule wise or quality wise in any way. Uh, and I kind of started to have some ideas about what I might want to do that were not necessarily story based. They were like, I kind of want to have a desert planet. I want to have science fiction, kind of a Star Warsy environment, but with a lot more color. So my first ideas were very much setting visuals types of action. And as I just lived with that a little longer, the character took shape a little bit. Some of the plot devices took shape. And, and then what really kind of dialed me into what the story ought to be was, you know, I love He-Man and Transformers and all that stuff. And kind of said, okay, what if this character was one of those types of things? He had kind of a status quo that was his adventure for five or six seasons, like He-Man was, like all that stuff. And we just came back to him in a few years to kind of took some of those those big epic elements and then said, okay, what if the war ends? What if they get rid of their arch villains, but then it's, you know, it never quite ends there. So it was to kind of take, and this is what's happened in the meantime. They've done that with, I think, He-Man on Netflix. They kind of said, let's come back to these guys and maybe play out their stories in logical ways that are not necessarily always more adult, but, you know, have a little more depth and, and take things to, well, what would happen to these guys if they kept doing this type of stuff? What would happen to these, this world if they kept fighting in this way? Uh, so that's where the story part of it really kind of came together. And that, that, that's what kind of broke it for me. It's like, okay, yeah, that's, that's interesting. That can work. That can put these characters through some good paces. So I think the cool thing about um, Captain August, I think he's a very fascinating character. So his, his, when I was thinking about his story, it kind of reminds me, and uh, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, um, the sense of uh, soldiers returning from Vietnam how yeah. they, they obviously they went into the war thinking they're fighting for the country, but when they came back, not they were not definitely not embraced by everyone for mm -hmm. and things that had occurred over time were also viewed as horrendous and things of that nature. So how much does Captain August exist as an allegory for soldiers returning from war? It's definitely like that. Um, in fact, the thing that really uh, helped me give that character some drama is I watched that Doctor Who revival with Chris Eccleston in about 2012. It had mm. come out, obviously, much before that. And he had, I think, wiped out his own planet because yep. it was going to destroy the whole you know, galaxy and the plot. And everyone was kind of appreciative of him in the gal like appreciate what he had done. Yep. Of course, he had saved him. And I thought, well, that's cool. But what if everybody like hated him? And I kind of began to think um, certainly soldiers in Vietnam is, is something that's come to mind or, you know, people that have been in Iraq and Afghanistan come back and had trouble. Uh, the guy that really, um, you know, made me think of his, I forget his name, but he's the guy that was the pilot of the Enola Gay. Uh, okay. he 
kind of, you know, I thought like, boy, if that happened today, it, he would be a very divisive figure. He kind of was even through his life as that, you know, his viewpoints changed on that. So uh, that was kind of my thing is I wanted to say, all right, we have, that was the one that really got me thinking because it's not just like a group of people or a, a type of person, like a soldier in Vietnam, which is, you know, not that personal. They're a, they're a group or an idea. What if it was just one guy? That, hey, that was the focus for all this anger, or maybe not, you know, some people love him, some people hate him. Um, everybody would have very strong feelings about it. So it really was a way to ratchet up the, the tension on the character uh, in a big way. So yeah, but that's definitely the type of thing we, we sort of, we want people to do things one way for us. But the second it's, they've done that, and we don't need them anymore. We, you know, we kind of treat them as it's good to treat them. And that's mm. you know, obviously not right. But is is what happens a lot of times. Now, from a, from a reader perspective and from the from the writer perspective, is Captain August what he what he has done um, in his past that we're calling the device of how much of a gray character is he? In other words, is he would is the audience approach him as someone who is in the kind of a gray area in for, for what he's what he did, or is it just those in his world's perspective? In other words, how much did he create him to make sure he walks that line for the readers as well? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I try to make it pretty clear in the story that people who are really angry at him, it's kind of they're angry at themselves. Uh, you know, like the, the villain played a much more direct role in what happens to August. At the same time, he was thought to be gone. I don't think I'm making a big spoiler there clear. Um, you know, if they keep mentioning somebody like in the beginning of the story, he's going to show up. So I think everybody will get that. But the, you know, the people that are really most angry at him are angry at him for his own for their own reasons. It's it's more convenient for them to say it was this guy. Let's be friends again. I hated that guy. I hated him all along. And I kind of thought of the way I, I had to write a report when I was in the fourth or fifth grade about about the atomic bomb. And I had to talk. You had to talk to somebody who was around that. So I called my grandfather, who had served. Uh, I think his, he was in the Air Force. I uh, maybe he was in the Army. But I said, "What did you think about it?" And my view, growing up in the '80s, was I was terrified of it. And I had a negative view of all that stuff. Not necessarily morally but i just wish it wasn't the thing we had to worry about mm. he said well we were you know we were just so grateful i was going to have to go to japan we were it was going to be you know horrible and bloody and tragic and terrible and, and that's also true uh, so it it really at a very young age i thought boy that's such a different viewpoint on that on that event and yet it makes so much sense and so that's kind of where the thing is with august i think he looks at it uh he's not terribly he, he kind of is like, I become this flashpoint as far as opinions are concerned. Mm. I think he probably feels responsible in that he was fighting in this war and he didn't necessarily question that. Does he feel like he kind of accepts what's happened to him, I, I guess, politically or socially? Um, personally, I don't think he's like, he, he understands it wasn't fair how he was blamed. So it's kind of a, a mixed bag. And, uh, and hopefully, while I never get too into the characters in a real exposition-y type way, uh, in the story, I keep the action, or I try to keep the action pretty quick and, and you know, concentrate on that. Uh, but I hope that I show a few times where people talk about him, that people are, have very varied opinions on it. Some people are like, it was bad what happened to you. Some people are angry, but you can tell it's like, they're not angry for the right reasons. They're angry. They're, they're being performative. They're trying to do something else with it. But I think the interesting thing about the situation is that um, obviously public opinion, some of that, that, some of that is negative. But the people who are being negative are able to be negative uh, because of the actions he took to protect mm -hmm. everybody. So the question is, you know, is that fair for you to be negative when you can only be vocally that way because of what yeah. was done? Yeah, I mean, that's def I, I want it to seem that way. So I, I hope that came across. Like, he's definitely, he knows that. He's like, in, in his viewpoint is, whatever this has been a terrible galactic war we've had it's been really divisive if this is what people need to do if this is just a natural thing that happens after things like this um, you know you look at how this own country obviously dealt with the fallout of the civil war in ways we're still grappling with you know things happen people become people who some people have done terrible things don't get blamed for them you know it just it kind of changes with what the people you know looking back want to to say about it do about it so yeah, I try to make it clear that it's it's not he he kind of accepts some of responsibility, but he's like yeah, a lot of this is not 
you know, these people are just doing this for their own ends. And, and they, you know, if they had the choice, they'd have done the same thing. So August comments that he has been a soldier since he was, I believe, 15 years old, if, if, if I remember that correctly. Um, does he fight because he believes in the Federation or does he fight because that's kind of what he's just good at? Uh, mostly because it's just what he's good at. I think he is very patriotic. And, I, you know, I, I developed this story for so long. I did a ton of drafts of it. And I, I've had ideas, you know, I kind of have in my head what his life was like uh, previous to this. And I always view him as in the, the times I allude to before this story starts, and you see a little bit up in the prelude, he was almost like Robin. He was the sidekick. He was kind of a Johnny Quest guy. So he was not the most, not a character with a ton of depth, but he was just very, you're very good standard hero guy. And then this happened and he's, he's got a little bit more of a dimension to him because of that. So yeah, he's, I think he, he was certainly very patriotic in the way that if you watch, you know, Batman in the sixties, Robin is just a very like, good, like, let's do this. Let's, you know, not, not too in depth, but uh, very in earnest is how I would describe. And that's, that's kind of his backstory. And then this is, well, what happens to that guy when he's, you know, the institutions he served really, really did not, you know, serve him very well. So how does he really view the struggle between the Federation and the rebellion? Oh, I think he thinks they're bad. Um, and I, I get in a little, I just got done actually laying out the sequel. I'd written it um, a while ago, the one that, which takes place decades later, and he's really old. And he's kind of talking about some of this stuff. And he, I think he is, I always wanted him to be a reflective character, uh, to not be, you know, the most talkative person. And I think he probably views it as, boy, this whole thing could have been avoided, but, you know, I'm on the right side of it. it is, I think his viewpoint as he gets older and kind of reflects on some of these events and events that'll take place in other stories, uh, he definitely, you know, explicitly believes by the end of his life. Yeah, we, you know, I, I look at each action I took. I don't think anything was wrong. I don't say like, boy, I really let myself down there. I did the wrong thing here. But he also thinks to himself, it got us to a very bad place. And at some point, somebody, me or somebody else needed to have stepped up and said, we need to stop solving our problems this way. Hmm. So I'm not I'm sure how much you can give away or not, but what is the basic source of conflict between the Federation and the rebels? Oh, uh, that's pretty, um, I don't necessarily get into that. And I might allude to that a little bit in a different story, but I think of it as very much, um, this is before I'd seen The Expanse, but the way that they approach that is it's basically just uh, almost logistics. The people in, in this, if you're on the outskirts, you're going to be treated differently. You, you know, you're going to be the way that like I look at this humanity has been expanding throughout the solar system and beyond. And just the logistics of that are going to introduce different objectives for different places. Some places are going to be dominated by other places and not not treated fairly. So it's it's pretty much. I think of it as an organic uh, conflict. It's like, well, these people were, Earth was always going to kind of need to treat these people unfairly, and they were always going to kind of need to say, knock it off. Uh, so a very, there, there's no like inciting event or, mm. or, you know, like big, big philosophical conflict, like we believe in this and we don't. It's just kind of one of those things. It's like, well, these people need this and these people need that. And it, it ended up being resolved in a, in a pretty bad, pretty bad way. So Basically, is one side more inherently good than the other? I would say yes. And I would say that's mainly August's side is good. He's not like he's not going to come to the realization, oh, I was fighting for the bad guys all along. He's he was on the right side. At the same time, I think it's very much what makes the other side really bad is the the people that are fighting on it were villains, became more aggressive, became more. I think they're the ones that push that conflict further. But I mean, again, if you look at if you look at wars throughout history, obviously there are regimes and rulers that are unquestionably horribly evil. Uh, I remember reading a book I think called The Next Hundred Years by a guy named I want to say Thomas Friedman. I could be wrong about the first name, and he was breaking down the strategy of Japan in World War II. And when we were taught about Pearl Harbor, it was always like, oh, they were cowardly and it was sneaky and. It, and yeah, I mean, obviously that's horrible, but he kind of broke down and he was expounding on this to explain current and future events and the way the world worked now. He said, well, really, that's the only thing a slight a country with a disadvantage that senses it's going to war has to do that. 
has to try and do this and, and even the scales dramatically at the beginning and start the war in the best, most advantageous way for them. I still think obviously that's evil. I'm an American and I, you know, I'm all, I'm all that, but, <laughs> but it, it made me, it really shook my head up a little bit about that. It's like, oh, wait, that's not, that's not the tone of what I was taught about that. It was like, well, they, this is what you do when you are, you know, this person in the fight sort of thing. So that's kind of the way I see it. Yes, the the rebels are evil because um, they're they're evil. You know, they're the they're the villains. They're probably the ones that pushed it to that point. I, I don't get too political in this stuff because I mean, obviously, this the whole thing is built upon a base of the skeleton of like this could have been like He Man or something like it. So it is pretty black and white, but. I do try to think it out to the extent that it could have made sense in a more, uh, a different type of story, a more nuanced, political, realistic type of a thing. So uh, obviously Captain August, uh, he makes references to his actions on Mars. His sex blame, accepts the blame for them. How truly at fault is he for what does occur? And how does he carry, how does, how does someone like him carry that kind of guilt over him? I don't think he's really responsible for it. And I don't know how clear it is in the story. Um, you know, really specifically the nuts and bolts, but basically it was kind of the situation was there was this big battle on Mars. It was kind of like the end of a James Bond movie. The rebels have developed this super weapon and he's trying to turn it off, realizes he can't. And I actually kind of cribbed this from the novel Moonraker. They, the bad guy, Hugo Drax launches this bomb at London. Bond realizes he can't stop it, but he can turn it around and shoot it back at the boat it came from. So he does that. That's basically what August does. It's like, well, I'll just make it, I can't stop it and stop it from destroying Earth, but I can make it blow itself up and hightail it out of here. And it turns out that it was more powerful than anyone thought, and it blows up the whole planet. So that's kind of how it happens. I think, does he carry some guilt from like being in that situation? Does he have some appreciation of how vast an event that was? And he was the guy who did hit the button? Yeah. Does he think that like, he, I, he also knows that if the guys that built the thing were around to be blamed for it they would have taken all the heat but mm. they had died so it was kind of like people just needed to deal with such a catastrophic event and had to personalize it and he was the guy the best guy to do that too so i don't think he feels guilty for that part of it he feels guilty for like well it did happen and i did do it um but i think that's the extent of it in, in his mind he's like yeah i did some things but it's not like i did not create this situation sort of thing so um, the antagonist, I'm, I might get the run, name wrong, Baron Sagan? Sagan? Uh, yeah, Sagan. 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 All right. Uh, uh, Baron he's not Sagan. a real guy, so he's never, <laughs> he's never corrected me once. <laughs> <laughs> so um, he's, like I said, he's the, the antagonist in the story, and he has a personal vendetta, it seems like, against August. Yeah. So what motivates Baron? Well, at the, in, the, in this story, pure revenge. He's, he, was, he and his wife um, were the sort of ringleaders of the rebels, and created that weapon they were about to use it to destroy earth more or less and um at that point he was still uh, and i think if you look at him you can see he's you know he's arnold schwarzenegger he's dolph lundgren he's like an 80s hero that has turned bad and i kind of approach him as like he was a bad guy but he was not a a really venal bad guy in the if this were a cartoon that we were basing it on he was like a bad guy but kind of a noble bad guy mm. And then after Mars happened, he comes back. He's he's a very bad guy. He's consumed with revenge. He blames August, um, you know, for obviously losing the war and for losing his wife, even though it's really his fault and it's his wife's fault. Um, so it's one of those things where somebody's mad at you because they're mad at themselves. So, how as someone who's writing a, a story that this vast uh, sci-fi futuristic story, how do you balance character building with world building? Uh, it's tough. And I'm sure you know this too, <laughs> but uh, it is tough. And I think the way I would, would, would do that is, is really just uh, when I sit down to write these things, I usually do it in Excel and I'm very much, I'm looking at how many pages do I have for this? I kind of say, I know what happens in an issue. I know what scenes are cool and what scenes are kind of exposition. I try to find ways to make the exposition fun as much as I can and to make sure it doesn't last too long. So I kind of say to myself, I have to, I mean, I have to map out A, B, and C. What are the most fun ways to get that information across? What are the most, you know, obviously in a comic, the most visual ways to get that information across also. So it's, it's pretty, it's a pretty mechanical process, I'd say, the world building, because it's, I, I know what things I need to say. And I'm at that point, just looking at my, my page count 
in my scenes and saying, okay, where is, where's the most satisfying place to drop this bit of information? So it's a pretty, not, not necessarily the most artistic of processes. It's, it's just, all right, where can this go? We gotta, we gotta fit all these, fit all the luggage in the back of this car and, and how's it going to work? So August Purgatory Underground is coming to Zoo. Is that correct? Is. And yeah. um, what dates do, does it run for? Uh, it's probably going to be live in a, in a month or two. We have the pre, we just got the pre-launch link up. Uh, it was released through Red 5 in stores last year. Uh, we're still waiting to do the collection. Um, I also wanted to, you know, get a little bit more uh, attention on the book. And, you know, obviously, hopefully, um, you know, just get it out in front of more people, get the character in front of more people, because I'm working on a sequel that I'm really excited about. And I thought, hey, this is a good way, if we're going to wait to do the trade, to just get the character out there, hopefully get some more attention on them to the point where when we start up the next one, uh, people are excited and want to see more of them. So I'm more familiar with Kickstarter than Zoop. So mm -hmm. for Zoop, are there reward tiers? How, how does it work? It works pretty much the same as far as you can set up what tiers you want. Um, the, the main difference as a creator is that the Zoop team is doing a lot of these things for you, planning, sourcing, you know, printers and vendors, coming up with what things are going to cost, uh, you know, things like that. So it would, obviously they're very, you know, communicative through that process, but it takes a huge load off of me as a creator to just have them doing that. I did that for the last issue of my other book, We Are Scarlet Twilight, and it was, the difference was night and day to just be free to, you know, do the book. I was done with it before the campaign was even over. Uh, as far as your experience as a backer, it's very similar. Uh, it's, you're gonna, you know, you get your rewards in pretty much the same way, updates in pretty much the same way. And, um, you know, you can contact the team at Zoop and they, they pass messages on to me and say, hey, we have somebody asking this, what do you think? Um, so I think from a, a customer or, you know, from a, a backer standpoint, it works very much the same. From a creator standpoint, it's just a great thing. And I mean, I do all these books completely myself. I'm the only person working on them. So to have all that help um, basically with the campaign is, is a great, great thing to have. So what kind of rewards can backers look forward to? For this, uh, it's going to be a collection of the story. And we are probably um, going to do probably going to do a soft cover and a hard cover. And the really fun thing about this is that the trade we're going to do in the direct market is going to be just the story. This, um, especially because they had such a long development process, I think I did the first issue like three times, almost completely. Uh, so I have all this artwork to show off. I have characters that ended up not being in the final version. So uh, I have a ton of pages uh, that are basically an art book, but also get a little bit more into the world, explain some things that didn't make the final cut of the story, explain some things that might happen in the future. Uh, lots of unused art, lots of design sketches. Uh, and those will be all be part of the main two books you can get. We're probably also going to offer uh, something we did with Scarlet Twilight was you could get, I do all my artwork digitally, but we offer really nice prints in black and white of the pages that we only will print once and have a certificate, a certificate of authenticity with them. And those actually did pretty well. I was surprised when the Zoo team suggested it, knowing that collectors are very, you know, they want the real thing and digital artists don't have that. But they said, oh, we did that. Those do pretty well. I said, oh, okay, let's do it. And they, those all did, um, went really fast. So we're probably going to have some of those. Um, obviously, all the special features that go with it. Uh, we might do some prints. Uh, we'll see about that. Um, but mainly the, the big draw here, the thing I'm excited to share with people is, is the big collection that has all this other stuff that would never have seen the light of day. But is, is cool. You know, I like it. And it, and it represents so much. Uh, you know, artistic experimentation and, and ways of working out the story. You get to see the characters develop, you know, as characters that, you know, see what they finally became in the end, uh, in the final story. So those are the, those are the big things that, um, you know, I'm excited that will be a part of this campaign. So kind of what it sounds like. So even if you have already bought these issues from Red 5, the collection is vastly larger and oh, more yeah. in depth and it's totally worth buying this as well. I hope so. I hope so. I mean, I, I like, I love all this other work that wasn't in the final story. When I finally um, heard back from a publisher on this book, they wanted, it was initially 12 issues. Then they wanted seven. Uh, they said, well, we'd be, we'd do it, but if it were seven, so I cut it down a lot. And they said, well, actually by seven, we meant four. <laughs> so I cut it down some more and I'm really grateful I did. Cause I think the tempo of it as four issues is exactly right. I think all my stories from this point will be four issues. Cause that's just, to me, keeps the focus on the character, keeps you dialed into their journey. 
um, emotionally in a, in a really good way. And it's, it's definitely the best format, but it also left me with a lot of characters that suddenly didn't have room to be in the story and it's great to they, they had a lot of depth they were really fun they looked cool uh, i'm excited that people will get to learn a little bit a little bit more about them because uh, they'll show up in other places uh, as well so definitely hope that um you know you'll get to see a prequel that was initially the first scene of the story that uh, is from a few different drafts it's pieced together but it does still function in continuity um, you can see a little bit more artwork on august's future and like I said, all the uh, the art book stuff, all the designs, unused panels, um, character sketches, development stuff. Uh, that's that I'm also really excited to share with everyone. And when can they catch the the second volume? Which sounds like it's on its way. It's uh, being worked on. I just got done doing all the layouts, so I'm doing some edits to the writing. I'm probably going to just look at that and figure out what pages I need to do to start a campaign, and hopefully. Um, this builds up a little bit more interest in the character. Hopefully, maybe late this year, I might be able to launch that. I'm still kind of leaning, you know, towards doing this over the next We Are Scarlet Twilight, but we'll see. Uh, we'll see how things go. And um, that'll probably be late this year. And what I'm hoping to do with that is a little bit of an atypical campaign is I'm going to, I think a mistake I made starting We Are Scarlet Twilight was each issue was, was its own campaign. And shipping, which was expensive at the beginning of issue one, even got more expensive over the years to finish. Looking back, I want to do one campaign for the whole book, but I want to preserve that monthly issue experience. Yeah. So what I'm going to try to do is get pretty far ahead, um, do the campaign, and be working on the books, um, which a lot of other campaigns have done. You, you do the campaign to launch the book, you work on it, people get it when it's done, and that finances some of the cost to be able to put, spend time making the book. Um, what I want to do is you're going to get all your printed books at once, but you'll get the digital versions every month or every other month. So it's a little bit of a monthly experience and hopefully I can have some interaction there, talk to people on YouTube, you know, have people on, talk about the book once it's come out, kind of do a post game thing. Um, so hopefully that will be how we approach that one later this year. Well, for the listeners, if you check the show notes, they're going to, there will be a link to the Zoop uh, uh, launch page. So please uh, click the link. And Mr. Morse, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk with you, sir. Thank you so much. And great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Uh, have a great night. You too.